So let's, let's pray. Father God, thank you for your goodness in so many ways. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that the promises of God are yes, and so be it. Amen. As we come to know Christ Jesus and walk in him. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, we pray that in these next minutes we share together that the word of God, living and active, would be applied to our soul, our spirit. And, Lord, that we would be changed, reproved, edified, built up, and equipped. Thank you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we have come today to the end of our study, our series in the book of Philippians. We've been here for several weeks. Amen. Okay. So we've been in the book of Philippians. And as I mentioned when we began, more than any other letter in the New Testament and more than any other book in the New Testament, joy is mentioned more often in the book of Philippians than in any other, any other book in the New Testament. And so as Paul was writing to the Philippians, um, it's, a letter, it's a letter of joy. And he was uh, rejoicing with them. Um, as you know, he had uh, founded the church on his second missionary journey. He's writing this letter after his third missionary journey. So some 10 or 11 years later, he's under house arrest in Rome. And he's sending this letter to the Philippians. And if you were here last Sunday, you remember the occasion. And that was that the Philippians, after 10 or 11 years, had found out where he was and had sent him a monetary gift. And so he received that gift. He was thankful to receive it. And he sends this letter back in return with a guy by the name starting with the letter E. Anybody remember his name? We don't use it much anymore. I don't think I've ever met anybody alive with this name, Epaphroditus. So there, if you want, Hannah, do you want to think about changing the name coming up here to Epaphroditus? <laughs> no. By the way, it's so good to have Hannah here. And she is praying for the soon coming of her, her child. So uh, here in the book of Philippians, we have uh, gone through all four chapters. And today we're going to do a review. So that's going to be a little different. Rather than taking one passage of scripture and really working our way through it, we're going to be skipping across uh, several uh, verses just to remind ourselves of what we have learned over the last weeks. But I, I, and I say I don't always do a study guide, but I, I feel it's so important. If God took the time to inspire Paul to write a letter infused with joy, we should be paying attention to that. These are things we should remember. And the first thing I put up here is remember, it is God's will that the follower of Jesus Christ live a joy-filled life. Think about that. It is God's will that you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, live a joy-filled life. And we've been over many scriptures, but I'll just give you one. John 15, about verse 11. Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So absolutely, it is God's will that we live a joy-filled life. That is not the same thing as saying we live a constantly smooth sailing life. I said I'd give you one verse, so I'll give you another one. James chapter 1, it's about verse 3. How many of you like to count things? Train cars, squirrels, <laughs> count things. Count, says the old King James, count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, when the sailing isn't smooth, when things are coming against you and things are rough, Count it all joy even then. Not because we're masoch what's the word, masochist, or where you, you know, do harm to yourself. Not that at all. But it goes on to say, because you know that something's happening when you encounter those trials. God is strengthening your perseverance. 
I love perseverance. I just don't like earning it or getting it. <laughs> I just wish I could buy it and swallow it and have it. And we get perseverance by going against the headwind. But we know that we're to let that have its perfect result. Because you can go against the headwind and just get mad. And that can be the end result. Or you can go against the headwind and say, fully on this, I don't need that Christian stuff. Or you can choose and say, Lord, develop that perseverance within me so that my faith is being strengthened and I become more mature. And the, the verse actually says, lacking in nothing. Whoa, ho, how about that? So we are to live joy-filled lives in the good times and in the tough times. Well, let's take, uh, let's go back and review this. Oh, yeah, so I have two questions here. Do you believe that it's God's will for us to live joy-filled lives? And I think you probably say, yeah, yeah, I believe that. Okay, next question. Does my life reflect that? Does the person closest to me, would they say it reflects that? <laughs> and some of you, I can say, yeah, I am pretty impressed with the joy that exudes from your life. And then there's other more like me that say, Lord, I need some pretty constant reminding because I can say, oh, my, what a burden to carry, what responsibilities. But praise the Lord. So does my life reflect the joy that God intends for me? Well, as we go through Philippians, we have found several sources of joy for the believer. So the first one comes out of uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 4. I thank my God, oh, verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. And so as we went through the letter of Philippians, we found that one of the main reasons or sources of joy for Paul was, and here, fill in your blanks, the strength and richness of our relationships with other believers the strength of our relationships with other believers and the richness of our relationship with other believers, fellow journeyers in this walk with Christ. Maybe you've done this. Uh, maybe in your prayer time, you, sometimes you pray down a list of people. That's, that's not a bad thing to do. But have you ever kind of flipped the switch and just begin to thank God for the people in your lives, the believers in your lives. Occasionally I do that and I begin to just, I, I use the word richness, but I begin to feel very wealthy. The people God has allowed me to share life with. I can look back to seasons of my life. There was a season when I first recommitted my life to Christ in college and God planted me in an inner varsity Christian fellowship group up at the University of Idaho. Great friends. And then I graduated and ended up in Boise. Kid from Moscow, Idaho. Boise was a big town to me. I didn't really know anybody, lived by myself in a single wide trailer house down below the uh, train tower. I uh, had, you know, I knew people at work, was getting to know people at work because I had just transferred into this branch at the bank. But God planted me in a group called the Philadelphians. And it was a singles and college and career singles group at Boise First Presbyterian Church downtown. And I began to make friends there. And then God began to add new people to the group. What a precious time. And I, I only lived in Boise at that time, about two years, and yet some really strong friendships that grew out of that. And then think of the first church I had the privilege of pastoring down in Irvine, California. Just begin to think through, oh my goodness, I'm tempted, but you don't know these people. I could say their names, you don't. But to me, they mean so much. And then here in our fellowship here, one of the greatest sources of joy, biblically and by God's design, is the relationships we have in the body of Christ. And first on that list is our, our tr present church family. 
Church is not a place you come to, watch, sing along with, and then go home. That could be a concert. Church is a place where you get involved. Oh, yes, we come for corporate worship. We come for the, the ministry of the word. But places of church, church is a place where we get involved and build relationships for support, for correction, for accountability, for encouragement. So, um, and as I'm looking out, I'm just, I'm tempted to start calling out people by name and say, we love you so much and we're so glad you're part of our family. And that's true. So, the first source of joy we find here in Philippians is the strength and the richness of relationships with other believers. Two questions here. Oh, well, and so in verse uh, 7, he says, um, I have you in my heart. Verse 8, I, I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. In chapter 4, verse 1, he says, you Philippians, you're my joy, you're my crown. So we've got those things. Two questions. Are you treasuring the relationships the Lord has given you in the body of Christ? Are you treasuring them? Yeah. Let's hear some good amens. <clears throat> Hilda told me Thursday night, you know, we're praying for our brother Bob in, uh, in the hospital, and please keep him in prayer. About three times in a very short conversation, she said, Bob is my friend. We need to, we do, we treasure these relationships. Second question, am I cultivating those relationships? Because relationships require, need cultivation, meaning that we need to spend time together, we need to stay in touch. Um, we need to ask, well, how, how are you doing? And be willing to really share how we're doing when the, uh, when the opportunity is presented. So are we treasuring and are we cultivating these relationships? Second source of joy. Amen. Let's go to uh, chapter 1, still verses 12 through 18. We're not going to read them all, but he says in verse 12, he says, I want you to know, Philippians, that what has happened to me, being arrested, being incarcerated for two years back in Caesarea near Jerusalem, being sent across the Mediterranean Sea and going through shipwreck where we had to literally swim for our lives. And all that just so I could get to Rome as a prisoner. And I am now under house arrest. And I want you to know that all of that has actually furthered the gospel. And more and more people are hearing about Jesus as the Savior. In fact, it's gone through the whole imperial guard. Think about that. Because he's in Rome. You've got the, 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 uh, the emperor and the imperial guard, the praetorian, the palace guard. Well, why is this guy in prison? What, who'd he rob or kill? Or what'd he do? Oh, he's a preacher. <laughs> now, that can happen in Canada. And it might happen in the United States before long. Okay, uh, every Sunday I get into some little political thing. Okay, back to so. But he said, because of what's happened, what's happened to me, the gospel is being spread. And so here, and, and so we see in verse um, 18. What then? Only, no, I've, but I left out a part. While he's in house arrest, there are other people outside who are taking up the cause. And they're preaching the gospel. You find this right there in those verses. And some of them are doing it with a pure heart. Others are thinking, hey, 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 Paul's in custody. Now it's my chance to rise and shine. And so they're doing it for selfish reasons. So then we read, though, in verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, he says, I rejoice. The second source of joy we find here in Philippians is when the gospel of Jesus Christ is being spread to more and more people. I was so thrilled. Dennis, can I say this? Wednesday night, you know, you invited your aunt to come to church last Sunday and she came. And she probably didn't understand a word I said because she speaks Spanish. But she came again on Wednesday night and she went to the Spanish Bible study that Katie leads. 
and I, don't, I hope you know this, but after the Bible study, Katie told me that that night in Bible study, your aunt, Claudia, received Jesus as her Savior. Hallelujah. Can we praise the Lord for that? Amen. Amen. Praise God. We get joy when the gospel is proclaimed and people respond. Hallelujah. Now, let's put a little subpoint under that. In verse 18, he says, whether by pretense or by truth. And so I put in our notes here, keeping the main thing, the main thing. That is, getting the gospel out and preaching the word of God. If we don't keep the main thing, the main thing, we will get distracted a thousand ways to Sunday and we will begin to see flaws in other people and we will limit and stifle the fruitfulness of the work of the Lord. So don't get distracted. And can I say this? Don't fall for the, the uh, suggestion that we can fix everybody. <laughs> How many of you have tried that? How many of you have said, that didn't work, but you're still trying anyway? <laughs> no, we, we can't fix everybody. And I'm not giving license to people to be idiots or anything like that. But we've got to keep our eyes on the goal. There is no one of us here that doesn't have some sort of issue. I've said this before, I know, but my Uncle Dave back in Kansas, who's still alive, God bless him, said, you know what? Everybody I've met is messed up except for you and me. And frankly, lately, I've been having my doubts about you. <laughs> that's, that's the way it is. Again, not giving license to just being slipshod, but we need to keep our eyes on the goal, and that is that more and more people will come to know Jesus. Here we go. Do some people lead a person to Christ one way and some another? No, it's not a different gospel. It is not. But when I teach on how to share the gospel, the teacher in me just says, well, I, I can't just give him one way. I could give you four or five different methods of sharing the gospel with someone. The Romans Road, Evangelism Explosion, John 3, 16. Lots of different, let's not get hung up. Well, you didn't say that quite, right? Maybe there is a time to, like Paul uh, did with Priscilla and Aquila, um, and he corrected them some so they, they had the, the message more accurate. But let, let's keep our eyes on the main thing, which is sharing Jesus with needy people. Okay. All right, so the second thing is when the gospel is proclaimed. Third thing is, and uh, Rhonda's going to love this one. I've heard her mention it, oh, once or twice or maybe 200 times. When Christians, and let's put here church members, because most of us are Christians, Lord willing. When Christians are united. Go to chapter 2, verse 2. Paul writing says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. And he really spends about three or four verses there talking about how believers need to be united. Things like being humble, putting other people first, encouraging one another, having compassion for one another, Putting the other person's interests ahead of your own. Realizing that the Lord loves them just like he loves me and he's working in them just like he's working in my life and to extend grace. And then I put this in the notes here. Are we quick to take offense but slow to let go of offense? I think it was Jesus, wasn't it, who said, offenses will occur. So are you going to undo what Jesus said? No, they are going to occur. We have a great capacity to step on each other's toes. <laughs> We're really good at it. We have to make a decision. Am I going to be quick to take offense and slow to let go of that offense? Or am I going to be slow to take offense 
and quick to let go of it. And so these things are very, very important as we work together to unity, toward unity. Ephesians chapter 4, I think it's verse 3, says, Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Being diligent doesn't mean, well, somebody else ought to take care of this. No, if I'm the one who's to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Nothing will make a church more miserable than lack of unity. It won't be fun to come to church. It won't, it won't feel right. That means there needs to be a lot of grace and forgiveness expended and extended and respect for one another and, and, and giving, as I said, grace to one another. Okay, so obviously there's a whole sermon on each one of these points. Ooh, here, I love this next one. Number four, this comes out of two, chapter two, verses 17 and 18. Joy is best when it's shared. Joy is best when it's shared. Verses 17 and 18. But even if I am being poured out, Paul writes, as a drink offering, they say, oh, okay, what, what does that mean? Basically saying, but even if I die, I'm here under Roman house arrest, but if Caesar decides I lose my head, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon your sacrifice, so you're going through suffering as well, upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, even if that happens, I rejoice and I share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Joy is better, it's best, when it is shared. I don't often tell jokes, but here's one. <clears throat> there was a preacher who had met Tom Knight. Thus, he had learned to golf. And a couple people in the room will understand that. That's not the joke, and I just threw that in. But anyway, so he liked to golf. And Sunday morning came, he was sitting in his study, he kept his clubs in his office just in case, you know, an emergency came up. And uh, he's sitting there and early uh, church is still about an hour away. And he thought, man, it's a beautiful day. Man, it'd be great to be out on the golf course right now. Yeah, I've got an assistant pastor, calls him up. Hello, Joe. Oh, boy, I feel sick today. I, I don't think I can make it. Could you, could you fill in for me? I'm sorry, I know it's last minute. Could you fill in for me? Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Maybe that pass, assistant pastor's name was Matthew. I don't know. And so, anyway, hangs up. Oh, wow, this is great. Grabs his clubs out the back door, jumps his car, off to the golf course. Meanwhile, up in heaven, Peter and Jesus are standing there watching what's happening. Peter says, Jesus, uh, are you going to let him get away with that? What? Oh, yeah, I got it under control. I got it. Okay. So, preacher gets up there. He gets ready to tee off here on the first hole. <laughs> hole in one. Peter goes, Jesus, I thought you said you were going to take care of this. I am. Who's he going to tell? <laughs> Joy is better when it's shared. And it's just kind of like, oh, I wish I had somebody I could share this with. So. That's part of the, the, the beauty of being in the church and in the body of Christ is we get to share our sorrows together and our joys together. Okay, number five. And this comes out of then the following verses, 19 through 30. But he talks about Timothy and then he talks about Epaphroditus. I mentioned him earlier. Epaphroditus had brought the money gift from Philippi to Rome. Paul had received it. Now, Paul is sending Epaphroditus back. He'd gotten really sick, and they, the Philippians had heard that he was sick. And so Paul knew they were very concerned for him. He said, yeah, he, he did. He came close to death, in fact. But God had mercy not only on him, but me too, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow and lose this guy. But now he's better, and I'm sending him back. Verse 29, receive him then in the Lord with all joy. 
and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. So the fifth source of joy is when we receive those who have ministered and given sacrificially in the service of our Lord. Wasn't it a delight to have Gary and Pat Henke with us about 10 days ago? To receive them with joy, those they, who, they have given of themselves and they shared with us, they spend several months frequently during a year in, in Africa, ministering there to the people there. What a delight. Or when Dick Williams comes, the first or second Sunday in January every year. This man who, he didn't go into his ministry to get rich, and he, he didn't get rich, but God has sustained him. What a delight it is to welcome him into our presence and our fellowship. So that's the, the fifth source of joy we see here. Number six, and this really is chapter three, about verses um, seven through 11, 10. And that is when we have discovered our highest purpose in life. I hesitate to even put this in because to, to go over this so quickly is wrong. These verses, really, you need to live in these verses. Philippians 3, 7 through 10. Why am I on this planet? Why am I here? You'll find the answer in those verses. And particularly in verse 8, he says, everything else in my life, my accomplishments, possessions, whatever it might be, what other people thought of me, I count them as rubbish because of the, here we go, surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The surpassing value. Have you found that in Christ? Christianity is not just a religion. It's not a performance mandate. Being a son of, an adopted son or daughter of the Most High God, is a privilege of relationship with none other than the very King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. To know Jesus, to know him better, more deeply, to receive from him, to share our hearts with him, the surpassing value of knowing Jesus. In all that we do here on Sunday mornings, all that you do in your devotions throughout the week and sharing with other people, raising a family, going to work, in all that we're doing, the greatest and highest calling in our life is to know the Lord Jesus Christ. When we have that purpose in mind, and then the following verses 12 through 17, and we are, we're not just saying, well, check that box, okay. No, we are pursuing our relationship with him, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies be ahead, giving ourselves to the lifelong adventure of learning to know Jesus. Hallelujah. There is great joy. Okay. Verse uh, seventh reason comes out of chapter four, verses two and three. And uh, we spent some time on this one when we got there. But the, uh, it is resolving relational friction. How, how do you like that phrase? Resolving relational friction. But when two people find that they're, they have some disagreement and apparently... From verse um, 2, Euodia and Syntyche had some disagreement. They were both strong Christians. They had both helped Paul in the work of the ministry. But there was something that happened. And who knows? One of them probably sat on this side of the church. And one of them sat on that side of the church. And they left at different times. Who knows? But it could, and then you know, it can get worse than that then this person begins to build allies, and this person begins to build allies, and oh my goodness. So it's very important, the word joy isn't in those first three verses, but it's very important that we resolve relational friction. And just real quickly, here's the four things that go into that. Number one, you gotta go to the other person. And that's usually where it all falls apart. I don't wanna go to them, I don't even wanna talk to them. You got to go to the other person. But here's the second thing. 
You've got to go with the right attitude. <laughs> if you're going to prove your case or let them find out what they did wrong, that's not going to go very well. You've got to go with the right attitude. That may involve some prayer, some soul searching, and some putting the interests of the other person ahead of your own mind. Number three, forgive and ask for forgiveness and mean it. And then number four, can I pray with you? And I'm going to be praying for you. After we're done with this meeting, I'm going to be praying for you. So those four things, go, go with the right attitude, forgive and forgive, ask for forgiveness and uh, pray. Am I going too fast? Sounds like it. Okay, um, number eight, and this is just a few weeks ago, but the, the things bef- I've mentioned up to this point are things that bring joy or are sources of joy. But number eight, there are some practical steps we can take to cultivate, there's that word again, cultivate a life of joy. And I know I'm, I'm repeating it, so you've got them there for you, but notice they're on that first page, the first four things, each one of those is a choice. In other words, these are things I can choose to do. Ah, but if I have to choose to do them, they're probably not my default behavior. Otherwise, I wouldn't have to choose to do them. I'd just do them. Do you think, you know what, in the next two and a half seconds, I'm going to breathe. (laughs) We breathe. But when you have to choose to do something, it's like, yeah, I probably wouldn't do that unless I chose to do it. So rejoice. We can choose to rejoice even when we don't feel like it. And since I've been preaching on this, I've been doing that. And it works, by the way. Rejoice. Um, The next thing is, let your gentle, forbearing, patient spirit. Well, I don't really have that. Yeah, Lord, help me here. (laughs) Let your gentle, forbearing spirit be known to every second or third person you meet. No, to everyone. Let everyone see this. Bye, you guys. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Okay, safe travels. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Again, that's a choice I can make. I choose not to be anxious for this. My default is I am very anxious. I am very worried. In fact, I am thinking of a thousand ways to solve this. Be anxious for nothing. But instead, number four, pray. Pray with thanksgiving. And then flip it over. After you have prayed, receive the peace of God, which surpasses comprehension, which will guard your heart and your mind. And then the sixth thing is focus on the positive. And that comes out of verse 8, chapter 4, verse 8. And I counted them up. And there are eight things mentioned there. Um, whatsoever things are you know, good, lovely. And it's, I get caught up trying to remember all eight. And I, I don't do a very good job. Some things are easy to memorize, like the fruit of the Spirit. These eight things are hard to memorize. So, don't worry about memorizing all eight. Pick one. Just pick one and focus on that. Okay? So, let's say um, verse 8. If it's true, focus on whatever is true, not the lies or the maybes. Or focus on what is honorable or what is pure or whatever is excellent. And think about that. We dwell on the negative all the time. So these are choices we can make. And then the the, um, seventh thing that are practical steps, and this comes out of uh, verse 9, and that is model your behavior after those who are better at living like this. All those things we said, rejoice, don't worry, don't be anxious, pray, let your forbear. Okay, if, you, if, you, if there's someone in your r- circle who's not perfect, but they're better than you are, copy that. Practice that. Let them be an example to you. That's what Paul's saying in verse 9. The things you've heard, learned, and received from me, do them. Practice them. Okay? So those are some very practical ways we can cultivate joy in our lives. And then finally, our sermon from last week was the joy of giving and receiving financial gifts. And this is a good reminder. I believe, and and we're going to do some teaching on financial stewardship. It's a discipline. 
But the thing about disciplines, if, if, they, if, you, are, if you make them a discipline, they become a habit. And the thing about habits is you just kind of do it without thinking. Um, and that, that's, that's good. But it's helpful to remember every once in a while, why am I doing this? Why am I putting my offering in the basket? Oh, to support the work of the Lord. I am, in fact, in that way, I'm partnering with the people here who are recipients of these gifts and missionaries on the field. I'm partnering with them in the work of the Lord. That's a source of joy, as it is for the recipient back and forth. So, um, and we learned last week, there's a secret to be learned, and there are two promises to hold on to. The secret to be learned, again, it wouldn't be default if we didn't have to learn it. But the secret to be learned is how to be content with much or little. How to be content. And then the two promises, verse 13 and verse 19. I can do all things. I can face any circumstance. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And verse 19, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We live in a marketing age, don't we? We are marketed up to the hilt to where we, we don't even want to answer the phone half the time. What product or what service can give you those two promises? No. But Jesus says, I can give you the strength to go through anything. And I can provide your needs according to my glories, my, my riches in glory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So that's a review of the book of Philippians. I hope you've enjoyed our study through this book, and I hope that this review has been helpful. Well, well thank you, and thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So <laughs> let's stand together. The... Uh, Verse 20 is actually, well, he, he says, say goodbye to some people in verses 21 and 22. But in verse 20 is a great conclusion. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Conclusion of the book of Philippians and the summation of your and my life. God, through my life, may there be glory to you forever and ever. Hallelujah. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week in Jesus.